Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation today. Um, the Choosing the Right University for You, Where to Go and How to Get There. Uh, my name is Brian Maher and I work on the international team here at the College Board. And I'm joined by David Buckwald. David, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. Um, hi everybody, I work at Columbia University in the city of New York uh, in the undergraduate admissions office where I direct engineering recruitment and uh, work on our international team. So get to travel and meet uh, many students where they are around the world as well as welcome students when they come to campus to visit us. Great, so thanks for joining us again and we've got a lot of very rich and great information to share with you today, so let's go ahead and get started. So today's presentation will first start with a timeline of how to prepare for study in the U.S., how to get started, um, factors to consider when choosing a university. Um, also, we want to showcase some of the College Board resources that we have available. We have a wide range of resources for international students specifically, so we wanted to point those out. And then finally, uh, we'll finish off with when you get accepted, what to do, what are some steps to take, uh, that sort of thing. So this presentation, um, this slide actually shows a lot of things. So what I want to concentrate first are those four, first four uh, arrows and the boxes below that. Um, we're going to break our our presentation down into those sections. So first is the, the college search, um, what, what you need to be aware of when you're first starting out um, about searching uh, for a university, what types of resources are out there for you, um, online resources, also resources within your own countries, um, and we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll also talk about things like English proficiency exams, um, SAT exams, maybe courses that you can take, um, things like that. And these are things that we'll talk about where you do them in the first couple years before you begin your university study. Um, in terms of things like English proficiency, um, maybe some courses, David, do you have any uh, recommendations, or can you tell us about Columbia University's, uh, let's say, English in proficiency? So if they don't speak English as a native language, uh, are there requirements that they need to sure. worry about? Sure. Um, Columbia, like other institutions in the United States, will have uh, its own policies um, for English proficiency and for um, uh, English language immersion. Um, in terms of exams. So in addition to what you might take like the SAT, which certainly will test in terms of critical reasoning and writing uh, abilities to process English and certainly to, to write, um, you may take exams like the test of English as a foreign language, which you know is the TOEFL perhaps, um, or the ILTS, the IELTS. Um, and so different requirements depending on the institution might be a minimum score to make sure that you can handle the uh, not just the rigor of the academic work, but the kind of rapid fire conversation that will happen. Um, one of the hallmarks, for example, of Columbia education is that we have these small discussion-based courses. And so when you're in these classes with 10 or 15 other people, it's important that not only do we feel like you can be successful, follow along, add to the conversation, but we want your perspective as well and be able to gain a lot from different points of view coming together in a room. Um, so we have uh, a minimum test score depending on how students do on the SAT, but every school will differ. Um, the good news is, uh, in the American higher ed system, as you may know, there are lots and lots of options which we'll talk about, and there is flexibility understanding that not everyone has had the chance um, to, to study English um, as, as a primary language of instruction. Um, for the years of high school prior to coming to the United States, and so um, most colleges and most admissions offices are sensitive to, to that. Yeah, and that's kind of a theme that we're going to talk about throughout this presentation, is that um, you know, you'll give some of your examples of what you require at Columbia, or what types of students you're looking for, but also, in general, um, the American higher education system 
is set up such that there's such an array of options and um, for you to choose from just what fits best for you. Yeah, it's exciting. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. Um, so before we talk about before you get started, I wanted to mention that you know if you type in your questions, we can see them as you type them in. So um, we're going after a few s slides, maybe about after 10 or 15 minutes. We'll take some questions if you have some particular questions about what we've asked so far. Um, but we will talk for the next hour. So if we don't get to your question, uh, we will cover a lot of things. So hopefully we'll be able to answer it as we go along. So, so this slide, before you get started, um, it's very important to really reflect about what's important to you, why you want to study in the United in a university in the United States. So we've kind of put out some questions uh, to think about as you're preparing for uh, applying to the United States. A couple of those questions are what kind of person are you, what are your interests, what do you want to do in the future, why study in another country. Um, so David, why is it important to actually, before you get into the process, to kind of step back and reflect about what you really, what you really want? Sure. I think it, it's one of the major, um, I think, bonuses of the American higher ed system is that there's such variety. So there's different institutions that might suit different personalities. So right. a great example of that could be if you're interested in going to an institution that's located right in the middle of a city like New York, right. or you might be very interested in um, going to a university where the entire campus or maybe community around uh, the campus is in a, a, a more rural or pastoral might be a nice way of saying that uh, slice of the world, and that might be partially based on your personality. Right. Taking that a step further, um, different programs, different personalities of, of, or cultures of the student body, the students attending that institution. Um, so an example might be um, an institution that prides itself on creative thinkers, or one of the small liberal arts colleges right. where students really like to challenge the norms mm -hmm. of their learning, question what's what's happening in, in the conversation in the classroom, and that's that's considered part of the mainstream for that campus. If that sounds like you, that can lead you on the direction of where your search um, may take you for a right college before even thinking about whether or not you'll major in economics or biology. Right. They might be offered at many different institutes. Right, and that's something that we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail, is this idea of um, the U.S. higher education experience is more than just your major or it your is. classes. That's right. That's right. So living on campus, which is something that can be very different from the rest of the world, um, depending on institutions. Right. Um, really getting involved, the whole idea of co-curricular life and all these different sports and artistic and cultural right. celebrations that make up uh, campus community. Yeah, excellent. Um, so moving on in terms of after you've had a little bit of moment to reflect and write down some of the things that are important to you, um, we wanted to point out some of the resources that are available for you online. These, on this slide you're going to see a screenshot of what you can find on our college search site. It's called Big Future. So if you go to bigfuture.org you can actually search for universities their profiles, details about um, what types of majors they have to offer, what types of students they're looking for, the requirements they have. Um, now this is one of many uh, resources you can find online, but it's a really good way to get details of, like we said, the, a vast array of universities out there. Um, I think at, as of today there's around 3,900 or so on our Big Future site. Um, so but it grows every day. Yeah, exactly. That, right? <laughs> and yeah, it, it, it's incredible. Um, so right now we've got, for example, Barnard College highlighted here on the screen. So this is a way for students to actually see one university versus the next university so they can kind of compare um, what some universities have to offer versus others. And Brian, I see some questions are already starting to come in from students, and there was a question about how you may search for 
um, programs. So say you're interested in a very specific major like electrical engineering and what Big Future might be able to do is give you a sense first of an institution um, but you can also get a sense of you know, different programs that are offered at different schools. Does an institution you heard of say does Barnard College have an engineering school or not or right. an engineering program? And that is something that you'd be able to look up on, on that site as a great way to, to uh, research. Um, and then once you maybe get a sense of schools you like, you can also look often on the school's websites themselves to get a sense of the program, the department, the school where you might study things like computer science or economics or um, pre-medicine as we call it in the United States. Yeah, and that's that's an excellent point. So this. The Big Future is a great way to start your search, to get to know um, what types of things universities are looking for, um, and if you go further in your in your search, you can go to the actual university's webpage. There's also other resources. Um, our international office here at the College Board has some specific things for international students that kind of those frequently asked questions type of resources uh, on our page. It's uh, international.collegeboard.org um, and you can visit that page and see the specific the specific resources for international students. This is great. So, so in terms of choosing a college, um, during your search there's some questions that we've lined up to actually help students kind of get a hold of where do I begin? Where do I go? How does it work? Um, so, David, could you kind of walk us through some of the steps maybe that you would recommend in terms of choosing a college? We have some questions here that might help help some people, and um, I wanted to remind everyone that's listening: if you don't catch something, that if we move on too quickly, if you don't catch something on a slide, uh, this presentation will be available afterwards, so you can actually. Um, go back and get the slides or listen to our webcast recording. So, so again, choosing a college. Sure. And recommendations. Sure. I, I think one of the big things, I mean, we talked a little bit about kind of starting with yourself first and figuring out kind of the things that motivate you, the kind of environments where you feel like you'd be successful as a student. And so once you get into more detail, mm -hmm. perhaps one of the ways to measure that is to um, for example, possibly on the College Board site, Big Future, mm -hmm. getting a sense of what the admissions requirements are, um, the profile that you often see, so the ranges of test scores that are accepted, or um, kind of the level of scholarship um, that a particular institution is looking for. There are so many institutions mm -hmm. in the United States that are uh, wonderful places to study that may be uh, more uh, open in their admission uh, selectivity Certainly. and so allow a number of students to study from abroad. Some other institutions may be more selective and kind of separate from that another thing to think about is for international students. Um, so as an international student studying in the United States there's a whole host of additional questions you may ask for. Um, you may ask about housing but certainly costs. Um, the kind of support for international students when they arrive on campus. Mm -hmm. So is there an international orientation right. where you can understand what the cultural norms might be, the mm -hmm. expressions that your new friends are saying that you can kind of relate and pick up on that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, understanding how to navigate, say, if you're in New York City or Chicago, the transportation systems to get around. Yes. Um, and so those are all things that uh, I think are important or reflections of perhaps how you may um, be supported and thrive once you're, once you're at a particular college um, experience. And so a lot of that is, if not on Big Future, would right. be available on the institution-specific websites um, that uh, are kind of linked from, I think, the, the college board site. Yes, yeah. And if, if you have, certainly, if you haven't had your answer, your question answered, during this online search, um, what types of resources can they rely on kind of outside just what's online? I know um, our Education USA offices outside yes. the US are certainly an excellent resource to tap into. Um, if you're not familiar with Education USA in your home country, uh, the resources are free. 
They are uh, professional and reliable. We have direct relations as universities. So for you, that means if you have a question and you went to a counselor or someone working at the Education USA office, you're, you can know that you're getting a reliable answer. Uh, free practice exams, uh, lots of college books, as well as usually free internet to kind of learn more about colleges are available. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big things is often I uh, see some questions already about scholarships and right. financing your education. And so Education USA can actually be helpful for your home country to let you know about possible scholarship opportunities that are available outside of even what the universities themselves right. may offer you. Um, some countries, um, some scholarship programs will offer um, scholarships perhaps that might be a fit for who you are as a student or your particular interest, whether it's a writing competition or it's a uh, science research competition that you win, and that money, that scholarship award can go towards your tuition and towards your living expenses at an American university. Mm -hmm. And as we, and as here at the College Board, we do a little bit of research on education systems outside the U.S., how we can best um, help those students trying to get to the U.S. And what the data shows is increase in home country funding. So countries actually promoting scholarships for their own students to go and study in the United States. So definitely don't just look at how David said the institutions financial aid offers, but also look at other options outside of that. So. And I actually, I mean, a funny story, a first year student at Columbia who's from the United Kingdom uh, wasn't really thinking about going to school abroad in the United States. Um, and she heard something on the radio on her way to school about a scholarship. And that prompted her to start to look. And from there, she wound up here at Columbia and in New York and studying in the United States. So um, I think what Brian's saying is very true to kind of look beyond even just College Board or Education USA to try to get a sense of what's going on in terms of support that might be available from your host country. Excellent. Um, so speaking of financial aid and costs, uh, on the slide you'll see some things to consider. Um, we just listed a few of those things, tuition and fees, room and board, mm -hmm. books and supplies, uh, transportation, and then of course personal expenses. Yes. Um, could you give us a little bit more detail than we've sure. We made a list here, but maybe what they can expect to, to see if, if in terms of costs. What most schools will do, uh, which is helpful, is that if you're applying for a program as a full-time student, the cost to consider you see on the slide, tuition and fees, room and board, books, computers, your flights, that will be all factored into what a school will call a sticker price. So you can get an estimate, a rough estimate, of what it might cost for you to attend each academic year. Often when you see that price, it ranges depending on institution, the variety mm -hmm. of institutions in the United States. It might seem very high, mm -hmm. and in some cases it is very high, quite yes. honestly. Yes. Um, but then that is a little bit different from the scholarships or the financial aid that, depending on the institution, may be available. And that's part of cost, too, is that at Columbia, we want you and your family, if you're thinking about applying to our institution, I would say the same for a lot of our peer institutions, mm -hmm. to be thinking about how you may finance your education at the same time. Having sitting down with your family, sitting down with your school counselor or someone who's helping you in the college process and talk about what options might be available to you as this might direct your college search a little bit. Um, and so all of these factors will be um, kind of addressed in some way by the college, but it's important for you to do the numbers or um, run numbers yourself to see how you may make this work. Uh, and I think we have some more uh, slides or we'll go into more detail about how schools will also uh, support yes. students as well. Yes, certainly. Um, that's something we're seeing more and more and more common. Um, but like you said, there's thousands of universities. Um, each has something unique to offer and each also has some unique financial aid offerings, especially to those international students that right. they want on board. So, so a good example of that uh, from our Big Future site is a screenshot here of Mount Holyoke College. So you're able to actually see that 
how much the tuition and fees are, as David was talking about, that sticker price. Um, but also, if you notice, towards the bottom of the screenshot, you'll be able to see how many students are actually, how many international undergraduate students are actually receiving some sort of financial aid, and that number, 485. So that's, that's quite substantial. a bit. That's quite substantial. That's substantial. So um, I would recommend don't get too scared necessarily by the sticker price. Know that um, there are financial aid options open. And as you can see here, Mount Holyoke actually offers well over $17 million worth of financial aid to their 485 international students. Um, do you have any recommendations or advice in terms of looking for financial aid other than what we've already sure. covered so far? I think one of the big things is, so every institution, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, because I know it gets confusing as a student trying to filter through all of this information, will have their own policies. And so that means that um, for some schools, the money that they may be able to offer you as a student will be based solely on your financial need. Some institutions may offer what we call merit scholarships mm -hmm. because they think your uh, extracurricular activities, your scholarship in your country is so extraordinary that they would love to have your voice as a member of their community. Um, and they may be able to offer you a scholarship regardless of, of what you and your family would need. Um, to be able to meet the cost of attendance. Um, so that will vary. Um, schools like Mount Holyoke that are very generous with financial aid as well as with policies that support international students um, may in many cases meet the full need for an international student. Um, one question that we get frequently at Columbia is are you need blind, which is a term you may hear for uh, international students. Mm -hmm. and for Columbia, we are upfront in that the term need blind means looking at or not looking at, in the case of need blind, your family's financial background when making an admissions decision on your candidacy. Um, we do, in some cases, look at a student's ability to pay um, as an international student um, where we, when we need to, uh, based on our financial aid budget, but when we admit an international student, we meet 100% of their demonstrated need. And sometimes for an international student, that is the complete cost of attendance. Tuition, room and board, fees, round trip plane tickets, the international orientation, the new laptop, mm -hmm. so that we're giving sometimes scholarships that are 60, 65,000 dollars a year, that that student, that you as a, prospective student may never have to pay back. Uh, and that is uh, an opportunity that varies from institution to institution. But the idea is when you see those really high sticker prices all from, <laughs> from this end, uh, the reality is that cost can be brought way down often with the institutional aid that a uh, college or a university is offer. Right. And that's another reason why we emphasize this idea of the planning process being more than just a few months prior right. to applying to the university because there's a lot of things to consider, um, not just what major you're going you're to take. So, um, so that's important too. So we'll always emphasize throughout this presentation about the idea of starting early and, and being very um, rigorous in terms of your research and uh, the complete uh, pick, getting the complete picture. Them. Do you remember, I don't know if you remember what you did for your college search, but I remember, and I still would do this, I had like a, a spreadsheet, like a, oh, a yeah. document that kind of listed all the deadlines, yep. uh, financial aid deadlines, different from the admissions deadlines, any scholarship deadlines, yes. uh, when the extra essay was due so that each school you could kind of map out uh, ahead of time, even, you know, well ahead of even applying. Uh, what I would need to do as an applicant. So. Right, it, that's very true, and we'll talk about it a little bit later in terms of num the number of universities you want to apply to, the types of universities, and, um, and that is going to come into play. It's going to be very really important. Um, so I wanted to move on next to in terms of factors in admission. So something that you'll hear about U.S. higher education and U.S. universities is this idea of the holistic admissions process, right. which might be a little bit different from um, where you come from in your home country, uh, where it's sometimes more of just an exam, or this 
this system really values this idea of a holistic process. So on the left side of the screen, we've chosen some factors that we call primary factors. Um, these are factors that we consider maybe to have a little bit more weight than other factors. However, the ones on the right, the additional factors are also incredibly important as well. That's where you'll be able to demonstrate uh, the type of person you are, the type of leader you are. Um, and that it goes a long way in terms of the proper fit for a university. Can you talk about some of these factors? Uh, first, in terms of quality and rigor of academic courses. Sure. Touch on, what does that exactly mean? So. So when my colleagues and I sit around the committee table and we're looking at different candidates, we face a, a large number of candidates who are very talented and we can only admit a very small number. So we look at how a student is challenged themselves within their curriculum, within their region of the world. Mm -hmm. um, we try not to compare them directly to a student from another country or a student from the United States. But within the curriculum, so if it's a, um, a advanced placement curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. You may have choice if the school offers 10 or 15 advanced placement courses, and we may ask which ones did you choose to take. Mm -hmm. Or for example, if you're in a country that has streams, have you chosen mm -hmm. uh, a science stream or a humanity stream, and does that relate perhaps to maybe where your academic interests are taking you? So if you're thinking about engineering, mechanical, civil, electrical, chances are you might be more likely to be in a science stream. And so we would actually be a little concerned if you weren't taking a very demanding series of math courses, if that makes sense. So the rigor matters in that we want to see you challenge yourself, especially in the areas of interest that you may have. Um, and then the quality kind of associating with that being um, the academic courses that you've taken over time, mm -hmm. over the three or four years, where you've had choice. I know not every school um, system or philosophy of education worldwide right. offers choice, but where there right. is choice, we want you to choose the, uh, the more challenging route. Right, right, exactly. So we get a lot of questions uh, about um, how, how much weight do you give on, let's say, test scores versus mm -hmm. your grade point average or how, you, how well you did in class. Can you touch on a little bit I know you may not be able to speak for the entire system, but, <laughs> uh, but in general, right. what is it that admissions officers look for when they see, oh, someone's done really well on the exam, or maybe you haven't done so well? Like, what? How does that work? Yeah, I, I mean, we are, we first we try to contextualize everything, which yes. is, um, I think, our way of individualizing the process for the student, the holistic review that you talk about is that each student brings their own kind of potential mm -hmm. and we evaluate them based on what they tell us, what they share with us mm -hmm. in terms of their transcripts, their teacher recommendations, their test scores. Um, we do look at test scores and test scores are one of the few barometers that across the world everyone is taking uh, CMSAT or um, another standardized test mm -hmm. or such. So that when students apply, we have at least one measure that kind of allows us to understand how uh, a student may uh, be predicted to perform mm -hmm. as, as college freshmen in right. the program. Right. Um, but the grade point average, the day in, day out academic coursework, that is very important to us. Um, in some cultures, in some country educational systems where it's the grades are more motivational, and mm -hmm. so it's really about the final exam. We try yeah. to contextualize that a little bit more, Absolutely. really look at those exams. Um, but where possible, we do focus on those grades. And then students who do really well academically, it allows us to maybe focus a little bit less on those test scores where we can. But the test scores, again, I think are um, one barometer of right. many. Uh, but one that we could look at with students across the world taking the same or similar exam. Right, right. Excellent. So, in terms of the additional factors, uh, we've written a couple here, personal statement and essays. Yes. I see a question I saw it, yeah. about um, how you write for a personal statement, how to write a good personal statement. Um, some extracurricular activities, letters of recommendation, so let's go through a couple of these. Um, sure. Uh, there's a lot. There's always a lot of questions about what is an extracurricular activity and yes. why is it so important. You know? So um, can you touch on a little bit about that 
topic. Sure. We want to know how do you fill your time outside of the classroom, right? We're in, you're in the classroom a lot of your day, but not the entire day. So what are you doing outside of class? And usually it starts with things that you tell us that you're interested in, and then how do you extend that interest? So you're interested in dance. Do you get involved in uh, choreographing your Founders Day production? Mm -hmm. uh, you are interested in football. I'm talking international football, not American. Thank you. Are you on your school football team? Are you perhaps involved in a number of different football teams? Because that's a real uh, passion that you have, or science research, but yeah. it also can extend a lot beyond school, and sometimes students don't realize we look at anything you're doing outside the classroom, uh, so writing on your own, art, drawing, sculpture, painting on your own, uh, research that you may do, maybe you have significant responsibilities in your family, you're right. the oldest sibling of six or seven, mm -hmm. so you help your parents after school um, kind of caretaking for your siblings. That, those are things that we want to know about in terms of understanding how you spend your time. And the goal to learn about that is to understand who you might be when you get to our college and our community. How might you make a difference to our campuses? And we value engagement, um, sustained engagement, leadership, as I've heard you say a couple of times. Um, and uh, when you have an interest, that you might extend it because it's indicative of what you're going to do with some of the great resources that we have on our campuses. Um, you know, part of what's so great about the American system are all these great resources that mm -hmm. the colleges and universities afford to you. Um, but it doesn't make such a big difference if you're not going to take advantage of it. Right. Excellent so advice. Um, what about the personal statement. That's sometimes a challenge even for me as an adult yes, to actually I write about myself and my interests and why I'm a good fit for a particular university. Uh, what can you say, what are some good suggestions, recommendations in terms of preparing for a personal statement and then writing one? What are some key sure. things to remember? Yeah, it, it, Brian, I agree with you completely. Uh, having to write personal statements for graduate school, it doesn't get easier over time to write about yourself. But what do you think? Uh, you know, uh, I think in a one-page, you know, or 650-word mm -hmm. limit essay that the common application, one of the major ways in which you'd actually apply to a lot of U.S. schools, uh, is looking for is really just a sense of who you are. So we don't get to know you as well as your family or your best friends or your parents or your teachers you like the most, but a short statement that maybe captures a moment that's indicative of who you are and what you value or um, your reflection on something you witness in society and popular culture that was meaningful. You just sharing a little bit about something that's important to you gives us a taste of your personality, how do you express yourself, um, and that is pretty much what we're looking for. We want to know about things to contextualize your candidacy. So challenges you've overcome, uh, successes that you're proud of. There are other parts of the application that let you do this. But right. the personal statement can be the only place where you get to talk about your uh, love of cooking mm -hmm. or your uh, fascination with James Joyce and uh, how you started, you know, reading to your younger siblings because you were so affected by the words, or uh, that famous night at school where after the choir concert you gathered with some of your friends and just had one of your most meaningful experiences of your life. Those could be very simple subjects that make for great personal statements. And I've heard a couple admissions officers say maybe some things to avoid. Like not repeating what is already on your common application. Um, and we'll talk about the common application a little bit later, but in terms of maybe not expressing, oh, I was very good in this class. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about sure. maybe some of the things to avoid as well? I would say in a personal statement, to recap everything we would have just read, as you just suggested, is probably not a way to give us a sense of who you are, what right. you you tech, mm -hmm. what you value. Um, I would also say talking about a um, particular academic challenge perhaps 
um, we will see that, we will note that, and we often will invite you in another part of your candidacy to tell us about any obstacles or any achievements academically, but this is more about who you are. Um, I would say sometimes essays where students try to be funny, I'm not very funny unless it's unintentional or yeah. I'm self-deprecating, so uh, I would avoid an essay where I try to be humorous. Uh, certain things that are very personal that maybe don't pertain to your college application that you wouldn't want broadcast over YouTube or uh, come up in a Google search probably don't make great personal yeah. statement topics either. So. Okay. So I think we're, we'll have a couple more slides in the future to talk about letters of recommendation and demonstrated interest, but I wanted to move on um, from this part to talk about the admissions testing. So mo we touched on a little bit about talking about the standardized tests that you take. Right. Um, and most four-year institutions in the U.S. require those exams. Um, and I mean, we recommend that you register well in advance. I was just looking at some of our data, and I saw that this year we have 1,400 test centers just outside the United States alone in about 190 countries and U.S. territories. So, um, and Education USA offices will also be a resource for you to actually find those uh, test centers. Also, um, a thing that comes up a little bit every once in a while is those extra things outside that one admissions test. You touched on a little bit about AP events mm -hmm. placement. Uh, a lot of students, I imagine, are also taking IP courses, um, maybe some SAT subject tests. So it might be wise to actually look at each institution's individual requirements because they require various exams. For Columbia University, they require the SAT, it's the SAT and two subject exams, which are of your own choice for mm -hmm. most applicants, engineers, one math and one science, um, or the ACT, which is a alternative exam, and then we would just recommend subject tests beyond. Um, I think the thing there is what you were kind of mentioning about planning ahead, so registering well in advance, but also kind of aligning maybe your test calendar to where you're finishing coursework. So if, for example, you are planning to take subject exams, if you're finishing the course in biology, it's probably a good idea to take the subject test in biology when you wrap up that course right. um, versus you know waiting to take it. Um, and planning ahead allows you to do that. Similarly, you might take the SAT a couple of times, right? Because scores can go up if you take it perhaps again over time. Um, and we often will take your, your highest scores of different sections in total, um, but you ha might have AP exams or IB exams, and so you don't want to have 15 tests in one month if you can help it. So right. if you plan out your calendar a little bit, you can uh, make sure that you have the time to take the SAT mm -hmm. in June and October while you have the AP exams, say, in May or something, or your national exams in April. Right, right. And it's it's very important to look at those specific institution requirements. Yes. Also. You don't want to get caught, let's say, applying to Columbia and then... Oh, they uh, vary the, greatly. Yeah, so, so a couple of our fellow peer institutions, uh, very similar to Columbia, and that a lot of students will apply to Columbia as well as those institutions, may have different test requirements. They may require three subject tests. Um, instead of the two that we require. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to start talking about uh, actually applying to the universities and the application process. Uh, so like we said, familiarize yourself with the specific applications of each institution. But something we want to make you aware of if you don't already know is something called the Common Application, called the Common App. And it is online in which you can fill out a form and it actually allows you to not redo those common questions that all universities ask for and it has variations of essay questions that you need to fill out. That's right. So that's very helpful in when we're talking about making that list of institutions to if you have institutions that are using the common app to utilize that. 
as a resource. Uh, on the bottom half of the slide, we're sort of talking about application deadlines. Could you go into a little bit of detail about the differences between regular admission, early decision? What does all that mean? And does that affect the, w the way you look at a student's perspective? Sure. For students, by and large, most of the students in, in the session today are probably in high school applying or on a gap year applying for first year admission. So when you're applying the year prior to when you want to attend, um, there are some different deadlines that vary by school. Um, some schools will have what we call rolling admission, so starting at the bottom. Uh, you can apply any time through the year. Sometimes they say until space fills up, so maybe you want to get your application in earlier, but rolling could mean even as late as the spring, so you could be applying now for the fall at some institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and it often means that not only do you get to apply when it works for you, but you will hear from the college at various different times. There isn't a set deadline necessarily. Then you have uh, you have uh, regular admission, which is on the top, which is by and large when most students will apply to most institutions. It is usually a typically uh, winter deadline, January 1st, January 15th, February 1st, and then you hear back a few weeks or a couple of months later if you've been admitted or not. And then you'll have time to, if you've been admitted, figure out is this the right fit, is this other school a better fit, how do I compare financial aid or scholarship offers, etc. The only other programs that often students hear a lot about are early decision and early action. Mm -hmm. And that is most schools will have one or the other. A few, believe it or not, have two, not to make it complicated, uh, where if you have a first choice, you have decided that you, uh, we say, believe Columbia Blue, because we're, uh, we're baby blue, we're the Columbia Lions, that's our athletic team. You know that you want to be in New York. You like our curriculum, our philosophy of education. We offer, for example, a binding early decision program where you apply as early as November 1st of your senior year. Okay. And if you're admitted in the middle of December, we ask that you withdraw your candidacy to all the other institutions you've applied to pretty much worldwide and matriculate at Columbia. So that's a binding commitment. Early action would be similar, so another peer school, say Yale University, mm -hmm. will have a similar November 1st deadline. But if you're admitted in the middle of December, you are not bound to matriculate. Mm -hmm. um, so you will have until May 1st, which is this national kind of reply date for regular decision or an early program to figure out if it's a right fit. The big thing with the early programs are some schools will limit you if you're applying early to that school. Mm -hmm. That should be your only early application. Some schools differ. And so, again, I think that's where a, a spreadsheet with <laughs> information yeah. that you created for yourself and for your family can be very helpful to guide you through the process. Big Future is going to give you those dates and deadlines. Yeah. I think yeah, definitely. That's a great resource so you can compare okay, what, what, which one's first, which one's second, what you need to come, come up next. So, so if you want to move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is something we didn't touch on during the, that previous slide. Letters of recommendation and essay requirements. Right. So um, we've posted a couple notes here on the slide about uh, how most schools do require letters of recommendation, uh, mostly from your teachers. And so we put a little bit of some advice, allow your teachers some time to actually write the letters of recommendation. Yeah. Um, do you have any recommendations for recommendation? Uh, I will often say, you know, choose teachers who know you well and like you. Mm -hmm. Just because you did really well in the class doesn't mean you developed a great rapport with the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, teachers who really you feel like have um, an understanding of some of your greatest assets in the classroom. Sure. Um, we look for um, a sense of how you are day in, day out, not just based on the exam, right. but leading up to the exam. Um, what kind of student are you? Do you ask questions when you're looking for clarification? Are you uh, enthusiastic about learning? Believe it or not, we actually look for people who <laughs> enjoy learning, who love ideas, and uh, and that's something that you know that motivates our committee conversation. 
Other schools may look for recommendations to verify different pieces of information that a student right. has told us mm -hmm. in their application. So looking to get a sense that that student, as they tell us, they're a great writer, the right. recommender also agrees with that, and that's very helpful. Right. Um, a lot of schools will require maybe a school recommendation, and then sometimes a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, some schools will require two teacher recommendations plus the school, and that, that's the case at Columbia. And I know at Barnard, which was also on the side, and I believe at Mount Holyoke, for mm -hmm. example. Excellent. So for this idea of after everything's been done, after all this work and all your spreadsheets that you've accumulated, um, in terms of after you've been accepted, so there are certain things that need to happen uh, that are kind of logistical and also require a lot of uh, time-sensitive things. So every student that is, gets accepted to a university that's not from the United States needs to have a proper student visa. So to have a student visa, you need to have a valid passport. So usually your university or institution that has accepted you will take you through those steps. Can you tell us what Columbia does or what in general institutes do to help students along? Once they've been accepted, what can they expect from an institution in terms of that help? Because that's a lot of that's a lot of things to take care of. Sure, I mean you definitely right with your offer of admission will direct you to start the visa paperwork. I mean most schools will do that. They'll connect you to their international students mm -hmm. support to help you through that process. Provide you with the information you need from Columbia. You're usually applying for that five-year student visa that gives you up to five years to finish your degree and a little time extra. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, you also are generally required for health insurance at a U.S. institution. Yes. Um, so either providing paperwork of insurance in your country and usually subscribing to the university plan, also taking um, necessary uh, vaccinations prior to attending, being in close quarters, living on campus. Uh, we will give you a sense of how to get to and from campus, um, orientation, when you would register for classes. Um, schools will help guide you through that process. Right. Right. Um, so usually you'll have resources, but it's important to uh, kind of assume that when you're admitted and you've decided where you're going to go, you have another kind of few steps to go. You're almost there. But you got to get that paperwork started right away. Right. Um, we've seen students who, if they don't get started right away, can have some trouble depending on where they are. Just getting the paperwork through in a timely fashion so that you can right. be on campus for when classes start. Right, right. And again, we made a note at the bottom of this slide to take advantage of the Education USA offices. They're, they are there for you and for this specific reason. So they can always point you in the right direction and give you. Um, appropriate and valid advice. So. We see a couple of questions, maybe from uh, from the audience. I see a question about faculty. Um, oh, okay, interesting. So whether you're applying for a graduate program or an undergraduate program, uh, I think it doesn't hurt if a uh, school may have a question about why you want to study at our institution to be able to share a little bit about the. Uh, the things that attract you to that particular school. Sometimes that includes the specific department or program. For undergraduate, you don't have to go into as much detail about the specific undergraduate program or faculty. It's more the overall experience, uh, generally speaking. For graduate programs, you would probably get more specific in terms of uh, either folks you want to do research with mm -hmm. or why this particular program is so exciting to you that you want to uh, travel across the world, in some cases, to attend. Right. Um, we have another question from Karina, asking if a student has a very strong profile in terms of the additional factors, and just above average, um, you mentioned DRE, um, but standardized SAT, tests, sure. yeah, standardized exams, would they be given equal priority as a student with exceptional grades? That depends, yes. In some cases, depending on the institution, that can be the case. 
Uh, so that's where the holistic part of the process will kick in. That's going to vary from institution to institution. Um, Columbia happens to be, uh, uh, just in my purview from the work that we do, uh, atypically selected. Okay, and so we, you may not like the answer to this question, uh, Karina, and I apologize, but we would want you to have those additional factors and the exceptional grades and testing in that case. Not every school is going to be like that. Right, and, and maybe in that case, it might be wise to look for those schools that really, on their websites and on their marketing materials, push to show prospective students that they are, they are looking for what's beyond just what's on standardized exams or good grades. They're looking for that more holistic person. So and I would say that that's probably where the profiles of a school, who gets in, exactly. that might be very helpful to kind of give yourself a guideline because you may like a school. This happened to me in my process. I liked a couple of schools where it was a little bit of a stretch for me and I opted not to apply when I realized, hey, maybe I'm not a good fit based on what the uh, profile for that school was giving me a sense of. Um, right. So that's, I think that can help you in your search and your way to answer that question. Right, and on the Big Future site, you, you can see among the freshman students that were admitted in previous years, right. what were their standardized exam scores, what types of students were they. So you can kind of compare yourself with what the university has traditionally accepted in the past. That's so right. that's, a good, that's a good gauge. Um, so we've got another question, and I'm trying to read it. I have really poor eyes. Do extracurricular activities have any an impact, impact on graduate admission and financial aid? Well, that <laughs> depends on the program. Um, I would say yes, depending on the program, uh, depending on that kind of experience. So if you're applying to, let's say, an American business school, right, or an MBA, or you're applying for a master's of science and engineering, for example. We have a lot of international students who attend our engineering school at Columbia. Uh, we will look at, yeah, how you might be involved on campus. While graduate students are a little bit different in their uh, professional focus, maybe their lives that they're living, if they're living on campus, we still expect them to maybe get involved and to contribute. So that can be plus factors in some cases. We have another question from, I believe it's Vanessa in Argentina, and she's asking about studying English right, and, and actually trying to find a scholarship. So this kind of goes back to this idea of um, looking outside the institution's offerings mm -hmm. to some things that are within your own country, maybe. Um, also, there are a lot of American language programs exactly, that you yeah. can, um, it's popular for international students who uh, will come to the United States and can study at different campuses um, to do a uh, English as a second language or American language program that will lead to a proficiency which might be what you need to then apply to a graduate school in the mm -hmm. United States or apply to an undergraduate program. Um, there are many of those that, that do exist, and Education USA would probably be a great resource to get you started there. Yeah. University. Um, oh, great question. How many universities should you look for? Is it too late to apply yeah. for this fall? Uh, generally speaking, uh, it is never too late to apply. It just, you may be restricted by a couple of things. Some institutions will have earlier deadlines, but many are still accepting applications. Test uh, opportunities, if you haven't taken the SAT, you could still be taking it for test sitting. They're offered several times a year. And as long as you have enough time to process visa information, figure out how you might afford it, there are chances to apply. How many schools, I think, varies. Um, one of the things that we say, a little bit different than for domestic students, is you may apply to more schools, eight to 10, maybe, maybe in some cases, just more than 10 if financial aid is a, a big factor in mm -hmm. part because there is more limited financial aid and scholarships for international students here in the States. Right. Um, generally for domestic students, we would say you might apply to, or US citizens or permanent residents, you may apply to fewer schools so you can focus on those applications. Right. But we are very sensitive, I think, to it can be challenging to obtain the funding that you need. So a few more schools on your list, if they're chosen wisely, right. may help there. 
Right. So we've got a few resources uh, for everyone to learn more. I know we went over a lot of information uh, in this presentation, but some things that might be helpful for you in your college search along the way are some of the bullet points we've pointed out here. Attend some college fairs. Really get out there and ask those questions that you want of those university representatives that may be visiting your country or college city. College fairs all over the world. I was just saying I am going to uh, Saudi Arabia. I will be in Dubai. I'm going to multiple cities in India. Going to Malaysia and Vietnam, and so my colleagues travel all over, um, and many schools will be on every continent or participate in different fairs with other uh, American schools throughout the uh, throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So, thank you all for attending. Um, if you would like more resources, uh, or if you would like to ask more questions, we've included. An email address at the, up at the top, international at collegeboard.org, and we have a few people that monitor that email address and answer every single question that comes in. You will get a personalized response huh? from us, uh, and we will direct you as best as possible to get you an answer that you need. Like we mentioned before, you can visit international.collegeboard.org for specific resources and recommendations, suggestions for international students. So it goes beyond just those general requirements and a lot of the things we talked about today are actually reinforced on that website. And then we've talked about Big Future a lot where you can do the comparisons um, in terms of admissions requirements and tests, sat.org slash international, that's where you can find when the exams are going to be taking place where they're going to be taking place, what the process is to sign up for the exams, early, <laughs> what you need to prepare for the exams, etc. And then um, we, of course, have our advanced placement site where you can get to know what the advanced placement exams are, where you can find those courses as well. So, And from the college side, regardless of where you might be looking, the college website can be a great option for very specific questions about programs, whether you're applying to undergraduate uh, or perhaps graduate study or a uh, American or English language program here in the States. All right, well, thank you all for attending. Thank you, David, for wonderful um, advice and presentation. And like we said, please ask questions if you have more at the email address provided and uh, good luck in your search and happy Wednesday <laughs> <laughs> yes bye bye thank you bye thank you